Hello, I'm Ben Mellers and today I'm here to talk to you about marine counter pollution strategy. I'm going to include information about the receiver of REC and the SOSREP. The Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, or MCA, is the competent UK authority that responds to pollution created by shipping or offshore installations. The MCA has developed a comprehensive response procedure that can deal with any emergency threatening to cause pollution at sea. The National Contingency Plan for Marine Pollution from Shipping and Offshore Installations was published in January 2000 and lays out the revised command and control procedure for these types of incidents. This was created in response to Lord Donaldson's review of salvage and intervention and their command and control. These procedures were specifically designed to be flexible so that they can cope with all levels and degrees of incident. The National Contingency Plan explains that the priorities in an incident is to protect human health and to protect the marine and terrestrial environment. The National Contingency Plan has four main areas of activity. It covers search and rescue, salvage, cleanup at sea and the cleanup of the shoreline. It also lays out which and what agencies should be involved. Here are some of the agencies required and what they do. The Department of the Environment, Transport and Regions has two main subgroups, the Shipping Policy Division and the Port Division. These are responsible for shipping policy and aims to prevent incidents. The Environmental Protection Group, or EPG, is in charge of, of the government's policy to, um, on environmental protection and has a broad interest in counter pollution. Its specific interest include protecting the marine environment and water quality. It also sponsors the environmental agency. The MCA is one of the biggest groups and it's in charge of minimising loss of life amongst seafarers. It's a 24 hour response to uh, maritime incidents. It develops and enforces maritime safety policy and pollution prevention in ships. And most importantly, it is responsible for minimising the impact on UK interests when pollution occurs. The Environment Agency protects the environment by putting emphasis on prevention, education and enforcement. This organisation works towards objectives set out by ministers, although it remains independent and impartial. DEFRA is another important organisation and stands for the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and they operate under the Food and Environmental Protection Act 1985. This allows them to provide provisions and protect protection to fisheries. They do toxicity testing and licensing of dispersants. This, or they also offer advice and control of the use of these dispersants. However, for permission to use these dispersants, you must first be given permission by the District Inspector of Fisheries. There are many other agencies required, and they include, but aren't limited to, the Harbour Authorities, the District Councils, the HM Coast Guard, uh, Environmental Health Executives, English Nature, the Police, Health Protection Unit, Food Standards Agency, RSPCA, the RSPB, the International Tank Owners Pollution Federation Limited and the United Kingdom Petroleum Industry Association. The structure of maritime incidents is three phase prevention, immediate response and long term response. I'll start with prevention. Uh, prevention is the easiest step to implement. Um, it's be it requires better regulations for shipping and this is the pre uh, preventative measure. The MCA can respond through the Coast Guard network. Her Majesty's Coast Guard network is the first port of call in an incident. They act as an umbrella organisation which coordinates all of the responders. The first thing they must do in an incident is decide if the response must be local, regional or national. They must also decide the potential of deterioration of the situation. They will usually dispatch the nearest ETV towards the vessel as a precautionary measure. Also, tug brokers with recontracted in case more tuggers are required. The owner slash master will then be asked for their intentions and therefore asked if they wish to enter into a towing or salvage agreement with whoever they wish. Phase two is immediate response and is usually centred around assisting active responders to try and control or minimise the impact of the incident. 
Other activities at this time will be centred around mobilising a SOSREP and his team. For those of you wondering what a SOSREP is, I shall explain. The SOSREP represents the Secretaries of State for the Department of Transport and the Department of Energy and Climate Change. They have ultimate control of an instrument by implementing the powers of intervention, acting as the overriding interests of the UK and its environment. Their main job is to assess the risk of safety and to promote the end of any such incident and to ensure the increasing risk is evaluated and appropriate measures taken to prevent or respond to escalation. Their jurisdiction is 12 nautical miles from the coastline and also the UK's pollution control zone. Continuing with Phase 2, the SOSREP can activate the National Contingency Plan leading on to Phase 3. However, when it's just a pollution incident, the MCA is also able to do this. Phase 3 is the long-term response. When it gets to this, the full potential for the pollution will be apparent, and this will mean containing and preventing pollution, removing the source of pollution, and cleaning up the pollution that has already occurred. Before I go on to my case study, I'm going to briefly explain the job of the receiver of REC. The receiver of REC is a government official that is in charge of processing incoming reports of REC in order to give the legal owner of the REC the opportunity to retrieve their property and also to ensure the law-abiding finders of the REC receive an appropriate reward. This individual operates on behalf of the Department of Transport and is located with the MCA. The current receiver of REC is Sophia Exelby. The case study I intend to uh, explain is the Torrey Canyon incident in 1967. It shed over 119,000 tonnes of oil, crude oil and is widely regarded as the first major oil spill. It all started on the 18th of March 1967 when the Torrey Canyon ran aground on Pollard's Rock between Land's End and the Isle of Scilly. Thousands of tonnes covered Cornwall and thousands more drifted across towards France. The main problem at the time was that no one knew quite how to deal with this situation and there wasn't any proper procedures to deal with it. It was given over to the Navy to deal with, which showed um, how little they knew. The Italian captain of the Torrey Canyon was blamed for the, uh, stranding the tanker on a well-known set of reefs. This created an eight-mile oil slick by nightfall. This caused authorities to use detergent to try and clean up the oil. However, this detergent turned out to be highly toxic. On Easter Monday, the ship had split into two, which escalated the oil leak. This prompted the Navy to bomb the ship, this were to attempt to um, destroy the ship and burn off the oil slicks. They did this using a mixture of normal bombs and napalm. They then decided to drop aviation fuel onto the oil slick to try and burn off all further oil. However, this was put out by the tide, which just involved more oil blowing into the sea. In total, 15% of the oil washed up on the Cornish coastline, which contaminated over 120 miles of it. The rest hit Western Guernsey. They pumped over 3,000 tonnes of standing oil from the Guernsey and put it into Tory Cannon Quarry. Later on, they discovered that the detergent they were used was the worst possible decision as, as it helped dissolve the oil into the water. This means more organised organisms could be effective and caused massive environmental harm. The only positives out of this entire situation is that it helped us uh, change the law and uh, it made us one of the world leaders in marine pollution response. Thank you. You've been great. This is Ben Mez.